that as we go into it, reminds me of the statement that is sometimes made by your pastor. The passages that are hard to understand are not as hard as the ones that are easy to understand. And this is one of these passages. You know, Peter says in his epistle that the writings of Paul are sometimes hard to understand. But the writing of Luke here is easy to understand, and I wish it were hard, because if it were hard to understand, I might have an excuse. And maybe you'll know what I mean as we enter into this. Luke chapter 6, verses 36 through 42. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. And do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. And he spoke a parable to them. A blind man cannot guide a blind man, can he? Will they not both fall into a pit? A pupil is not above his teacher. But everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye? But do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, Brother? Let me take out the speck that is in your eye. When you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. So, we look at this, and we say, what am I going to do with this Lord? Have you ever had a time when somebody has done some really horrid thing to you and you were angry and you were hurt and then all of a sudden you found that desire to get even? Never get mad, but get even. Never get even, but take revenge. And I remember years ago, I hadn't been in the pastorate too long, but someone who I considered to be a close friend really did some what I considered terrible things and they were done to me, of all people, his friend. I found myself pacing the floor at three o'clock in the morning. I almost gave him a call to let him know how the cow ate the cabbage, but then I decided, no, he might be too groggy to understand. Then I decided to write him a letter and mail it in the morning, and some still small voice says, anybody who writes a letter before sunrise and mails it is a fool. I was finally left with only one conclusion to draw. And that is, I had to forgive. This was like giving up a precious friend to think that I would release this person from the debt that he owed me. But I know that by now, most of us understand that when we refuse to forgive, we are trapped in a time warp. When we refuse to forgive, we find ourselves in a position where we cannot enjoy the blessings that God gives to us presently. And those are just some of the problems that our Lord fails with or deals with today. And he speaks more as the teacher to his student. Remember that we are looking at the Gospel of Luke through the eyes of the teacher dealing with his students, dealing with his disciples. And we have pointed out that to be a, a Christian in the deepest sense and the broadest sense of the term is to be a disciple a follower of Christ. And so every issue in life ultimately has to be asked under the question, what would Jesus do? We know this question before they gave out bracelets, and we know this question after they quit giving out bracelets. And this is what we understand, that discipleship itself requires dedication to the teacher and his teachings. You can't be a follower of Christ and say, I don't care what he says. You can't be a follower of Christ and say, I don't care if he tells me to do this. You may not care, but you cannot claim to be a disciple of Christ. And we are required to be dedicated to the teacher, and our teacher has given to us a responsible lifestyle. When we speak of freedom, 
we speak of the freedom to follow Christ, the freedom to make the decisions that Christ would have us make, the freedom to in every respect reflect our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And this responsibility has positive and negative duties. There are rules and regulations in any walk of life. We can find the most libertarian of people, socially speaking, politically speaking, and they can say that they are free, but they have their own rules. And those rules are duties to them. They regulate their lifestyle in a consistent way. And we should expect the same. And there are duties which have positive and negative aspects to them, and both have consequences. So let's look at this, and we begin with the positive duty to be compassionate. Understand that this is a foundational principle for you and for me as believers. Jesus would look at the crowd. Remember that he had, Luke points out to us, that there were those who seemed to be there for what they could get out of it in terms of the healing and the like. There are those who are there evidently just wondering what's going on. But there was a broader group of people who seemed to be interested in Jesus Christ and his ministry. And then he had his disciples. He had already called the twelve. And if we go back, what we notice is that he speaks directly to the twelve and primarily to them. And he, calls, he then gives this message to you and to me, every one of us who say, I am a serious follower and disciple of Jesus Christ. And the requirement is this, be merciful. Be merciful by the standard of your heavenly Father. Be merciful to the same extent that your heavenly Father is merciful. We're to be like him in his compassion. When we decide that we're going to take vengeance, we want to be like him as judge. But he never gave that opportunity to us. That is not our option at this present time, if at all, except to judge ourselves. And we are to be like him who is ever and always compassionate and merciful. And notice that this compassion is a mandate. This is not a, well, I guess I'll do this and not do that. We are called upon as his people to show compassion and to show mercy. This is who we are. This is why we're here. And this is what we do. And we always need to get on with it. And this compassion is a continual practice. The command simply is this, always be merciful and always be merciful to the same extent that your heavenly Father is merciful as well. Merciful to you, his children, and merciful to those who are not yet his children. And it is to be something of a reflective practice. We want to do this because in the end, we want to reflect the goodness and the greatness of God through our lives. It's an interesting thing that some people can say, I can go into the wilderness and I can see the greatness of God in the best sense of the term, in the biblical sense. But all you're going to see is the greatness of his power, the greatness of his intelligence, but you will not see the greatness of his compassion. That remains to be seen through Jesus Christ and his followers. And this is why we are here this day to encourage one another to love and good deeds, which requires compassion. And so it is reflective. And notice that our compassion requires something from us. Give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. For the time being, let's just look at the command. Give. Continuously give. Our compassion should be more than a feeling. Sometimes you can feel a deep sense of compassion for a person. But the kind of compassion that we are talking about here is the compassion that moves us to action and action that are expressions of mercy. It's more than a compelling feeling then. And as we are compelled to give, Notice that we are also speaking of ourselves as well. But we'll deal with that in a moment. But as we look at this context, what we come to understand is that compassion reveals itself in the form of forgiveness. And this is one of the hardest things to do. 
Perhaps we can feel compassion for a person who can't cover a medical bill. We feel compassion for a person who cannot keep the electricity going or any number of things that we can fill in. But notice that in this context, forgiveness is an expression of compassion. And this may be a lot more difficult to do than to help someone financially. It's a mandate. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Notice the first two are negatives. Do not. Do not judge. Do not condemn. But notice pardon. I like this term pardon because it can be translated to mean forgive. But also it means to let go. To release. Along our walk with the Lord and with his people. We have found those who have locked into a problem where they have been hurt in some way and they can talk about it as though it were current events. But when you find out about it, it happened years ago. They are still living in the past and that event controls their lives. And the only one that should control our lives is the Lord and our faith and our trust in him. And this is why it's interesting that we take a look at this word and understand one of its basic meanings. Let it go. You can pay a lot of money to go to a counselor to hear the counselor say, let it go. Or you can read your Bible that you've paid for and it was probably a lot less than a counselor to hear your Lord and Savior say, let it go. Forgiveness means you let go of it. Forgiveness means that you have freed yourself of the burden and that you can get on with life and you can say, this we leave to the Lord. And notice that this is also a mandate. Do not judge, do not condemn, but pardon. Always be ready to pardon. Always be ready to forgive. Now, if you're carrying the burden Remember, I'm only relating what Jesus said. Don't get mad at me at the door. I'm the messenger. This has happened before going through these forgiveness texts. So past experience tells me, let it go. Let it go before you get to the door. When you shake the preacher's hand, you can say, Pastor, I let it go and I will say, Amen. But to be serious, notice. Release yourself from the burden and you release yourself from the burden by releasing that individual who has a moral, ethical debt that must be paid to you. Let it go and leave it with the Lord. And notice that this compassion requires something from us. We have to give in any number of ways. But notice this is a mandate to be regularly practiced and notice to be persistently practiced. I love this. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but at 70 times seven. I like to picture this in my mind. I like to picture Peter as having mulled this over in his mind and he's got it down pat. And he knows what mercy and compassion is all about. And he's going to go tell the Lord how he has this clearly in his mind. And he knows that his Lord and Master is going to be proud of him. Lord, guess what I've got figured out? If somebody comes and does me some harm, I forgive him. If he does it again, I forgive him. And I do it up to seven times. You know, Lord, in biblical interpretation, seven is the number of perfection. How perfect must I be? And Jesus said, well, nice try, Peter. Let's go back again. The first thing that you got right is seven. But you forgot the times 70. That amounts to something like 460 some. If a person comes to you once a day, he's going to be doing it for a whole year. As I were to see him coming, I would be pulling down the curtains and locking the door and not answering the doorbell. But notice, we need to be persistent at this. If they're coming to us and seeking to be forgiven 70 times 7. But this one I like just as much, if not even more. In Luke chapter 17, verses 4 and 5, and the Lord is saying to his followers, and if, his sins, and if he sins against you seven times a day, notice not seven times, but seven times a day, 
the Lord kicks it up a bit here. If he, if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, oh, look what happens. Let it go. Forgive him. You can almost see somebody say about the seventh time, you know what, it is what it is. I've let go of it again. Get the hints. But I love the apostles' reply because I'm sure that we have been there one time or another. And the apostle said to the Lord, Increase our faith. Notice that forgiveness is an expression of faith. It is an expression of the kind of strength that faith requires. And it seems to me that to increase our faith basically is to say, increase my strength to do that which I am committed to do. And so we see that we have this positive duty. And notice I deliberately put it under the term compassion. Because compassion seems to be the primary objective that our Lord is trying to get across to his hearers and now to his readers. And I want us to understand that forgiven, forgiveness is an expression of compassion. We can be compassionate when we see the missionaries come and show us the poverty that children are in, and we can dig deep for that and any number of things, and so we should. But notice when we are dealing with people who have done us harm, there should be compassion, the compassion that says, I forgive you. Come tomorrow, I forgive you. Oh, we're doing this once a day? Let me put it in my calendar. But you come, and I will forgive. This is who we are. This is what we do. And this is why we are here. The one thing that I notice that takes place in society is when they talk about this person doing that which is right or that which is wrong, and they want justice. There may be punishment in justice, but where is the forgiveness? That's one of the main things that's left out of the social debate today. And once you talk about forgiveness, you are talking about sin. It's difficult to have a dialogue, and not talk about sin. But this is what our society does, and it will get nowhere until there is some sense of sin and understanding of compassion. So then, we also must have a proper self-interest in this as well. And this will lead us into our next point. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Take a look at this. My own best interest, spiritually speaking, the welfare of my relationship with the Lord depends upon my ability and my willingness to forgive. If you do not forgive, your Heavenly Father will not forgive you. What does that say about my spiritual well-being? What does this have to say about who I really am? What does this mean in terms of eternal life if my Father is not forgiving me? Proper self-interest says that if this very day we are still holding a grudge and we are not forgiving, our relationship with our Heavenly Father is seriously damaged and flawed, if not, if not non-existent. These deal with our positive duties in the basics. Let's look at our negative duties in the basics as well. And it is primarily to refrain from being judgmental. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. And do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. This is something that's really interesting to me. Notice it is so much the idea is do not ever take up the practice of judging. Do not take up the practice of condemning. Now this is where it gets tricky. Most of us know this. But there are those people who seem to do it very well. And to me, I say this with tongue in cheek. Look out for somebody who claims that they have the gift of insight. Or they have this intuitive gift by the Holy Spirit. And then they go ahead to use that to judge somebody and to condemn someone. The intuitive gift is not there. It is being judgmental. Notice that the negative statement is, 
Do not judge. Do not make final decisions. Do not act in a sovereign, authoritative way over another person's life. You do not have that, that chance at all. That is not your domain. So don't go there. Don't do that. They are not to be put on trial. And notice they are not to be condemned. Take a look at David. There would be a time in the life of King David that somebody would say, he is not a believer. A man who commits adultery, covers it up by murder, what do you think? That's pretty much of a heinous thing. Adultery, murder, and cover the whole thing up. And he was willing to live with it as best he could until the prophet said, thou art the one. We don't dare condemn even when we find brothers and sisters so low that they have to look up to see bottom, it is not our prerogative to say, this person is not a believer. It is our prerogative to say, let's do what we can to bring him back to where he ought to be. And forgiveness is a part of that job. But when you judge, you cannot forgive. When you condemn, you are not forgiving. Therefore, pardon is what is called for. Now then, no authoritative decisions. Notice next. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye. When you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. We're forbidden because we are not qualified. Keep this in mind. We see the faults in the lives of others, and we can see them down to the tiny minutiae. And we do not realize the faults in our own lives. Notice the term, moving from to see and to realize. You can see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but you don't realize there's something going on about the mental process, about a false self-interest. You do not realize the fault that is in your own eye, and it is big. And notice that this is not an innocent blindness. He goes on to say, you hypocrites, you do know you will not give your brother or sister a pass, but you give yourself a pass. Oh, well, boys will be boys. You remember the story? Notre Dame had just won a really great football game. This was on a Saturday. And on a Sunday, the internal lineman went to church, and he went to the priest, and he said, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. What did you do, my son? Well, I played football yesterday, and I broke an opponent's nose. Oh, that's not good. But not only that, in the third quarter, I broke a shoulder of my opponent. That is not good. In the fourth quarter, I knocked somebody out cold. That is not good. By the way, my son, who are you playing? Southern Methodist University, Father? Oh, well, boys will be boys. <laughs> somebody got a pass there, I suppose, as the story might go. But you see what the idea is here, don't you? Sometimes we will always give ourselves a pass. We will always say, oh, well, that wasn't much. But even if we reduce it to that's not much, it is still something. And so why is it, he says? Notice that we see the faults of others, but we do not realize the faults in our own lives. And when he comes to the term hypocrite, that tells the whole story. We see it, we realize it, but we deal with it differently than we do with other people. And that is forbidden. In other words, we're to take care of ourselves and not minimize, but call it what it is. This is why communion is such an important time. One of the most important things that we can ask in our prayer time is, Lord, show to me the beam that is in my eye. Show to me what I am doing with this beam. And he will do that. 
Now notice we have basically dealt with the positive, with the negative, and let's look at the consequences of our actions. Notice that the idea here is do not judge and you will not be judged, and do not condemn and you will not be condemned, pardon and you will be pardoned. Don't ever enter into the practice of judging. And when you don't do that, you will not be judged. Don't ever enter into the practice of condemnation. For if you refuse to enter into that practice, you will not be condemned. And then notice he shifts over to the pardon, to the positive. Continuously pardon and you will be pardoned. If we have contrasts going, that last clause, pardon and you will be pardoned, can also be if you don't pardon, you will not be pardoned, because we've already read this, haven't we? If we don't forgive, God will not forgive us. Therefore, let us be sure that we do not judge, we do not condemn, that we will pardon, and we will not refuse to pardon. The one who judges will be judged. The one who condemns will be condemned. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. We do not need to spend much time here except that we want to underscore the idea that is, but if you do not forgive others. Notice there is the understanding that this is our duty. There is the understanding that this is what we do as followers of Christ. This is who we are as disciples, and therefore, the consequences are these. Your Father will not forgive your transgressions. No one who is a true believer ever wants to live a life knowing that the Father is not pleased with who that person is. Notice that there are some positive consequences along the line as well. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Pardon and you will be pardoned. Notice, don't judge you won't be judged. Don't condemn, you won't be condemned. Pardon and you will be pardoned. Notice we're not perfect. Notice this, that when we are pardoning others, we will also be treated the same way as we treat them. And wasn't that one of the earlier statements in this passage? That we want to treat others as we want to be treated ourselves. How do we want to be treated? We want to be forgiven and accepted. Therefore, let it go on others and it will be released on yourself. What a tremendous statement this is. So then read here, give and it will be given to you. They will pour out into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over for by your standards of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Let's go to that last statement first. By, the, by your standards, by the standards that you establish in your relationship to others, by your standards of giving either copiously or in a stingy manner, you are setting up the standard by which you will be treated. We want you to be compassionate, the Lord says, and you must set up the standards that express your compassion. And if you are compassionate in a very copious and generous way, you will be treated in a very copious and generous way. Give, and it will be given to you. Make it the practice to give, and it will be given to you. They will pour out into your lap a good measure. Have you ever seen some of those pictures of the old times when I used to say, what's the matter with these real men? They're running around in robes. You know, real men run around in Wrangler jeans. That's what they do. And here's these guys running around in robes. This should only be in their house. But they were, they were pretty slick about it. They had this long, long piece of fabric that hangs down in front, and then they kind of sewed it up, and they had their own pocket purse right there. And the Lord says, hold out your pocket purse. We're going to press it down real tight. We're going to shake it so that it's not loose. And then you're going to have a good measure. So good, in fact, it will be running over. That's the way your Heavenly Father will treat you. And remember this, the responsibility is on our shoulders. A proper self-interest says this, I do want to be blessed by God. I do want his blessing on me as full as full can be. 
then set the standard of being a blessing to others. Set the standard of being very compassionate toward others. And that will be the return that comes to you. So then, what should we say? We look basically at the mission of Jesus Christ, the master, the teacher. To be a Christian is to be a disciple. To be a disciple is to be a learner. To be a learner is to be a practitioner. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but the world might be saved through him. Notice that last verse. Why are we here? Walking in the footsteps of Jesus. Jesus did not come into the world to judge. He goes on to say the world's already judged by their unbelief. He came into the world to be the Savior of mankind. And therefore, when we are followers of Christ Jesus... We are not the ones to judge and to condemn. Sometimes some churches take on some great, they get great exposure in the newspaper on TV, and they're being exposed for the condemnation that they're calling down on someone else. That's God's call. Our call is show the love, the mercy, the compassion of God as he has shown it through Jesus Christ, he wants to show the same through us. This is what it's about. God did not send the Son into the world to judge, but that the world might be saved through him. Through him, through us, by God's grace. That's a part of our challenge. So the question is, when I want to be judgmental, how can I be following in the footsteps of Jesus, who at this time is not being judgmental? Paul says in the book of Acts, the day is coming when he will call all men into account. But until that day, this is the day of compassion. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Notice that the compassion and the mercy of God has as its effect, its result, comfort. And notice that God is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he is the Father of all tender mercies. He is the Father of the comfort that comes from those tender mercies. And notice God's purpose. He comforts us in all of our affliction. Sometimes when we say, God, why is this happening to me? Look at this verse. He comforts us in all of our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Notice how this flows the Father of Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies, the mercies that bring about comfort to those who are afflicted, that God wants us to bring his mercy to their lives and to their pain and to bring this mercy to them that they might know the comfort of God now and forever. This is who we are. This is why we're here. Why in the world do we want to play the role of judge? It causes nothing but added pain, it causes nothing but pain for the one who seems to be vengeful. Nothing good can come from it. So the issue is today, if you are still wrestling with trying to forgive someone, walk away now. Let it go now. Use the rest of your life to show the compassion and the mercy of God and the salvation through Jesus Christ for whom we live. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer, we thank you for the life that you have given to us. We thank you for the mission that you have given to us. We are told in your word that as the days come and go and time slips away, that there will be an evil that rises that has not been seen before. And that many who make the claim, the love of many will grow cold. We ask that we will never be in that position 
We pray that we will always have a warmth that is the effect of your love in our lives. And may that love also be expressed in terms of compassion and tender mercy to bring comfort to those who are in pain, the pain of unbelief, the pain of hurts that should have never been inflicted. Use us and spare us that we might not fall into this trap of judgmentalism. In Christ's name we pray, amen.